Welcome back. Today what we're going to do is we're going to look at nationalism. Uh, we'll look at the role of nationalism in quote-unquote liberating Central Asia as well as other parts of the Soviet Union. And we'll look at whether nationalism played a generally positive or negative role um, looking at ethnic violence and how communists tried to harness nationalism for their own means. We're going to start with a quick review <coughs> looking at what ethnicity is. And uh, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, an ethnic community has, as you recall, the following features. A collective proper name. The Kyrgyz. The Uzbeks. A myth of common ancestry. We came from this place. We, are, we descended from these people. Uh, shared historical memories. We remember the period when we were deported uh, under Stalin, for example. One or more differenti differentiated elements of common culture. So uh, Manas being the hero of the Kyrgyz, for example, um, the customs, whether they come from the nomadic customs um, or, or sedentary people customs, rites of passage, um, often Islamic, uh, so these sorts of things. An association with a specific homeland, relatively new, uh, but now we do have a Kyrgyz homeland, Kyrgyzstan, a Kazakh homeland, Kazakhstan. Uh, a sense of solidarity for significant sectors of the population. We feel that we are a Kyrgyz, Kazakh, um, whatever that is. Now, you go from ethnicity to nation when you have this political assertion by the community and you have this push for the community to be in its homeland. That should be an it, not is. Um, so at, at this point, we can begin to talk about a nation. So the Kyrgyz are a nation because they're in their homeland. They're demanding uh, sovereignty over their homeland, uh, economic unity, all these things that we've talked about. So that was your quick review. So let's look at ethnic resistance in the Soviet Union. As you recall, nationalism is really an old issue in the Soviet Union and Central Asia in general, and more particularly. Lenin and Stalin used this nation to help them do many things. So again, just, just to, uh, to review, uh, we had, you know, the, the, it helped separate these hostile anti-communist tribal units, um, potentially undermining pan-Islam or pan-Turkism. It facilitated the organization and planning of the state. It satisfied local demands for national recognition by giving them something, some sort of autonomy. And it created busted localized interests in the new system, these loyalties. Uh, and you'll remember, of course, the crutch argument, which is that nation was used to help, uh, help build communism. And then nation would sort of disappear. So the nature of ethnic revival, what we saw in Central Asia was fueled really by earlier events. In the 1960s, you had the spontaneous rise of nationalist currents in Khrushchev's thaw. This, it wasn't particularly strong at all. It couldn't be because Khrushchev's thaw wasn't particularly strong, especially in, in Central Asia. What it tended to, to do is focus around long-ago traditions, like the yurt, for example, the yurt being the sort of teepee uh, that nomadic uh, peoples used to use. Um, people were more interested in traditional music, in arts and crafts. It wasn't around religion, though. This was something that Khrushchev had cracked down upon, so Islam didn't feature prominently here. So you had these occasional flare-ups also of, of ethnic unrest, of ethnic protests. A big one, a big case here was the 1969 attack on Russians by ethnic Uzbeks following a soccer game between the two sides. This was a big deal. It was rare, it was small-scale, but it made an impression. People remember this to today. And it could be used by local elites to show a need for more resources. We need to help address these underlying causes of conflict. You also had affirmative action policies that were common in the Soviet state, which suggested nationalism had a future. So, for example, the, the titular nationalities were the most important within the republic in terms of <coughs> running the republic. They received this sort of affirmative action. You also had the popular growth of titular nationalities. In Uzbekistan in 1959, the Uzbek population was 62%. By 1989, it's 73%. In Kazakhstan, it's 30%. Uh, in the 1950s, by 1989, it's 40%. So, still relatively small, but it's certainly not a homogenous nation-state, or a nation-state even, uh, but, but an increase in the number of titular nationalities living there, members of the titular nationality, I should say. So, this was caused by naturally high population growth, but also some outflow of non-titulars, especially in the 1980s, who were disadvantaged in, in that republic, uh, whichever republic it would be. So the titulars also represent an increasing proportion of the urban population. 
In Uzbekistan, they went from 37% to 54% during those years I just mentioned. In Kyrgyzstan, from 13% to 30%. So you have more of your of, of the, the titular nation being represented in the cities. The cities being a key place for mobile, social mobilization, political mobilization. Uh, just, I guess, for a quick review uh, of the political ethnic structure. Remember, the center was historically Slav-dominated, nationally advantaged. So uh, the, the Russians, the center, we're talking about Moscow, and this is where the Slavs dominated. You had some Central Asians, but not very many, um, none from certain Central Asian republics. And then within the titular, uh, within the titular republic, the titular group was nationally advantaged, or locally advantaged, I should say. And then the non titulars were delegated to relatively weak positions. They were generally disadvantaged. So all of these things helped to create um, movements for nationalization. Um, there were undercurrents of nationalism early in the social movements in the Glasnost and Perestroika period, but most of these movements were focused really more on concretes. They were mostly homegrown issues, the sort of not-in-my-backyard issues, socioeconomic issues, um, environmental issues. Uh, that goes back to the not-in-my-backyard. Where are we going to build the incinerator? Where are we going to do the nuclear testing? Um... Other socioeconomic issues included housing. Um, you know what? I'm not on the right side, am I? Oh, there we go. Um, sorry. Uh, so housing, land. Uh, but early on, these took on nationalist tones. There was a reaction to the cotton scandal, which I'll talk about in more detail a little bit later. Uh, there was a 1986 appointment of Russians uh, of a Russian as the Kazakh's uh, first secretary of the Communist Party, something that was usually reserved for the titular nationality inflamed Kazakhs led to riots. Only later it evolved into this nationalist agenda, including um, language, for example. <clears throat> and this raises an economic argument. It's not about ethnicity at all, perhaps, but about control of resources. There were reasons to doubt the emergence of a strong nationalist movement in Central Asia um, at the time that all this was going on. You had the dominance of family and clan identities before 1917, there was this Soviet man, which I've talked about, that was fostered since the 1930s. You also had a population that was so multinational by this point. You had all these different nations represented. At the same time, nationalism is the emphasis of us versus the other. Soviet nationality policy actually strengthened this. So you can think of those three types of actors that I talked about back here, those at the center, the titular, and, and non-titular. What they were doing is they were pitting these groups against each other. And that in itself created more and more nationalism. Again, there was a competition for resources between these groups, which could lead to a nationalist agendas. Uh, agendas. And the outcome of this was this rising nationalism uh, in the early 1980s, late 1980s, early 1990s. So between 1989 and 1991, all five Soviet Central Asian republics passed language laws, emphasizing the prominence or the, the dominance of their own language. You also had the nativization of cadres, especially high level and especially after independence. You had high-level appointments, people in parliaments and factories uh, who were nativized. In other words, the titular nationality grew even more important. Uh, you also had cross-border shows of force. Uzbeks in Osh, which is in Kyrgyzstan, for example, held a referendum on actually joining Uzbekistan, joining the Uzbek Republic. Remember, this is before independence. This wasn't officially condoned by the Uzbeks, but there, there were some winks and nods going on there. Interestingly, nationalism in the West is often a movement of the downtrodden, but the greatest nationalist movements in the Soviet Union were actually led by groups characterized by the highest levels of education, the highest socioeconomic status within the state, the greatest level of political power. So in particular, these included Armenians, Georgians, Estonians, Central Asians who were comparatively, comparatively disadvantaged along these fronts came much later to this nationalist movement. That's why we've got really 1989, 1990, and especially 1991. And this is likely because these masses, those with the greatest economic or social status, were the ones most often hitting up against the glass ceiling, which I discussed earlier, which was one of the big reasons the Soviet Union fell. So they were hitting against this glass ceiling versus most of the nationalities within the Central Asia were not. So, again, in particular, I'm talking about people in the Baltics, the Georgians, the Armenians, who had high, higher socioeconomic statuses, and expected more from the system. The Central Asians were much further down. So the equation here is that these republics and these peoples were getting dividends through redistribution, but the economy was faltering. 
the money was devoted to the arms race, and so these dividends were actually falling. At the same time, they had greater numbers of educated people who were better off, and, and they had a growing population, who sought to join the privileged class. And remember, in Central Asia, again, you didn't have this as much. This is what caused nationalism in the Soviet Union. So some of the potential causes of nationalism, uh, one is socioeconomic status, which I've just talked about. Um, but if it, at the time of incorporation into the empire, local elites can be guaranteed the same status as those in the core, most are going to be probably pretty happy. They're going to be co-opted. Over generations, people see that mobility is linked to this and they become more assimilated. But if they see the core as a source of restraint or decline, then nationalism can be reactivated. In other words, if their socioeconomic status is now uh, being held back, then, then nationalism comes back to the fore. And you, you, you have these demands for national separation from the current state. So those elites who have been on the back burner, who have stronger allegiances and networks with the masses than the core elites, the, the Communist Party elites, they can stoke this fire to regain their status, to regain power. Also, young people tend to be enthusiastic, those people who are searching for mobility the most, who find that the core nationals are occupying lots of positions of power and they're being squeezed out. So co-opted leaders have to struggle. They have to stay with the status quo, status quo and risk losing their credibility or go along with the new flow and risk being replaced by the core. In other words, by the communists who are in power if they lose, if the, the sort of rebellion of sorts loses out. So, Estonia, this is the, the most favored lord argument. Estonians really lacked a favored lord. This is the, they were not in with the center, and so they had very little stake in it. And they sided with nationalists. The Estonian communists sided with nationalists. The economic dynamism model really won. Central Asians weren't favored lords, and they weren't these economic dynamists. Rather, they were these welfare colonialists. In other words, they were the, the victims, I should say, of welfare colonialism. Victims. Maybe victims is the wrong word. They were the recipients of welfare colonialism. The center gave them health, they gave them education, they gave them industry. Uh, the local, local titular elites administered the republics. And they were also paid off for the political acquiescence, again, uh, especially during the Brezhnev period. So they liked being with the center. It paid off for the Central Asian elites to be with the center. And they only took nationalist uh, policies very late in the game. Now note here that clan identification frequently appears uh, in Central Asia rather than ethnicity. Karima, for example, was running Uzbekistan through appointments of his people from Samarkand. In Kazakhstan, the Great Horde versus Lesser Horde uh, were competing for political positions. So now that we know some of the goals of nationalism, empowerment, and why we have nationalism, let's talk about the ugly side, ethnic fighting. Actually, I'll take this on a new set of slides.